Thank you. Well, this is a fascinating um, result, but also not a surprising result. And in some ways, it's a bit of a trick question. <laughs> because one of the things that I will talk about is how you can't actually separate out strategy and execution. That when you're working on really complex problems, you are constantly resetting strategy, and you're learning about what that reset needs to be because you're executing and you're learning as you execute. So uh, before I get started, I wanted to say, first of all, thank you very much to the Carlsberg Foundation, uh, Fleming, and uh, the, your wonderful team that's pulled together this. I've already learned so much from these diverse topics that I feel like I talk about all the time, but I've gotten so many fresh uh, perspectives. And now it's my time to share a little bit of uh, what we do um, at the Rockefeller Foundation. So I am the Vice President for Initiatives and Strategy at the Rockefeller Foundation, which basically means I oversee our programmatic work finding new opportunities, shaping strategies for what we think might have potential, and then leading the implementation and execution of this. And I know the uh, official title of my uh, talk can be a bit of a mouthful, which is how research foundations can best deploy and adapt strategies to achieve their goals while managing organizational change for implementation. So, so I'll summarize it down to two basic ideas, the idea of strategy and the idea of change. And that's what I'll be uh, talking about. On strategy, there's thousands of articles written on strategy, and there's thousands of people who will help you uh, with strategy, including some of Natalie's favorite consultants. Um, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that, because what I'm more interested in is actually how you implement strategy, and I'll spend some time on that. And then on change, uh, you know, the assumption is if you do have a new strategy, you will have to change your organization somewhat, and change is very hard to do, and particularly for research organizations. Uh, I think it's hard to do because the bias in research, or, uh, research organizations is to be very analytical with thinking, and change is actually fundamentally an emotional uh, phenomena, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'll end this discussion with a little bit of a pitch to all of you, uh, which is this new way and new lens of thinking of uh, attacking social challenges, which is resilience. And we've already heard that word in a few of the presentations. It's something that's a big emphasis of ours. I'll spend some time talking about that because I think that uh, we will have some major grand challenges in the 21st century. I don't think we always know what they will be. So there's a different way of looking at the world if you just think that it's going to be challenging and we need to figure out and address those challenges as they emerge versus trying to pick what they are up front and investing. Uh, and I'd, lastly, I just want to share that a lot of this presentation is grounded in just my own personal experience. It's not based on thorough research, but I did originally start my career as an academic researcher in uh, fluid dynamics. I then moved on to become a management consultant for a number of years, focusing on strategy and change, and then working in philanthropy. So it's been an interesting perspective to look at all of these problems. Before I get into the topics of strategy and change, I want to share just a few perspectives uh, and some context about the Rockefeller Foundation itself. Uh, we uh, have had the same mission for about 100 years now, which is to promote the well-being of humanity throughout the world. And today, we interpret that mission through two overarching goals for our work. So the first goal is to build resilience, and where we're helping people, communities, institutions, and cities prepare for, withstand, and emerge stronger from acute shocks and chronic stresses. And this can range all the way from a big snowstorm that's hitting New York, uh, which is where I live, and I may have time to go visit the Carlsberg Museum, uh, if that's the case, and test out whether Carlsberg beer is really different than Heineken beer. Um, and our second goal is around advancing inclusive economies. So how do we expand opportunities, uh, not only for women researchers, but for youth who are looking for jobs, and make sure that everyone is sharing the prosperity that we're seeing increasing around the world. So we, with our partners and grantees, are very focused on catalyzing and scaling transformative innovations uh, where we can create unlikely partnerships that won't happen with a little bit of um, a boost or a little bit of the, the tail wagging the dog, as was said earlier. Now, one of the benefits of being a 100-year-old foundation is uh, we have incredible records of all the decisions, all the reviews, all the reasons why they thought things would work, uh, and all the assessments afterwards. We have about two miles of these records. So one thing that I've found really interesting is to go back in time and look at the practice, because often we can create simple stories of why things worked, but when you look in real time at the memos and the decision making and the thinking, you get a lot of insight into how people thought about strategy and change. 
Now, we actually don't fund that much basic research uh, anymore, but we have a long history of funding research. And, um, and this was really based on the premise uh, that John D. Rockefeller himself had, which was, how do we not spend our money on charity and just sort of putting a band-aid on the problem, but how do we get to the root causes? And so a lot of the foundation officers had a philosophy of really diving deep in a scientific approach to understand, and the value of knowledge was very important. And uh, we funded research that's led to the development of entire fields, such as molecular biology, artificial intelligence, uh, American urbanism, and we also more recently helped with Jed's help as well, catalyze and put attention on the field of impact investing. We are very proud to have supported more than 220 winners of the Nobel Prize over the course of our history, and countless others who have pushed knowledge to new limits. So here are for a few examples uh, on this page. And starting in the upper left corner, you'll see a gentleman in a lab. This was a very classic way that we supported research at the beginning, was to support fields and to build up institutions. And we were just chatting about uh, Heidelberg University, which was a recipient of some Rockefeller funding to start the social sciences, uh, which we also did at the University of Paris and other uh, European universities as well. So this notion of field building, this picture itself is taken in uh, San Diego at the Scripps Institute for Oceanography, was an important way that we worked. Then if we move uh, to the upper right corner, you'll see a big uh, telescope. Uh, it's uh, the Palomar Observatory's Hale Telescope. And actually, it's fascinating to look at that project because it is just a painful series of memos of cost overruns and trying to decide whether they should stay involved or not. It ended up being about triple the amount of the cost. And I don't think we've funded a telescope since uh, that experience. <laughs> Next, in the bottom right corner, you'll see a picture, and this is uh, Vannevar Bush's massive analog computer uh, in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and this was in the 1930s. Uh, in the 1950s, we funded a conference that coined the term artificial intelligence. And I point this out because this was really funding knowledge and science for its sake. But who would have known that all of these investments in information and communication technology would lead to mobile technology, which more recently, with the applications to mobile finance and mobile health, have been catalytic in improving poverty and the well-being of people. And that is a 50-year journey, and I can assure you, if you scan all the notes and all the memos of the reasoning for investing in artificial intelligence, it was not there. And I think that must be such a conundrum for research institutions, is to understand how will some of these bets play out, because they play out in very uncertain ways. And then lastly, moving over to the last box where you'll see two bowls of rice. This is really an outgrowth of our work in the 1950s and 60s after we spearheaded the Green Revolution and had quite a presence in agricultural development. This here is golden rice. It's a hybrid that introduces vitamin A into otherwise nutrient-lacking grain and offers better nutrition to millions. This is one of the key approaches, most cost-effective approaches to addressing child blindness. The challenge is it's a genetically modified organism. And when we invested in the science and we invested in the research, uh, we did not invest in thinking about the social dynamics and the social issues about it. And, uh, and it's, it, this also points to an interesting uh, challenge, which is where one group of people might view that as one of the solutions to a very preventable problem. Another group of people might look at that as the tip of the spear of genetically mo modified organisms and entering into a whole scary area where we don't feel we have knowledge or control of it. And I couldn't come to Copenhagen without referencing Niels Bohr, of course. I'm sure most of you are familiar with him. He won the Nobel Prize in 1922 to contributions, the understanding of atomic structure and quantum theory. We made an early grant to Niels Bohr, who needed some lab equipment and expanded workspace. And you can't read it on the right, but what's interesting about the right is that he actually would often write to the uh, foundation officers, offering them advice on which other uh, scientists to fund, which young scholars should be moved around into different areas as well. So not only were we funding his direct research, but in partnerships with people like Niels Bohr, we built up a capacity and network of people working on these fields together. And this is something that I'll talk about as well later, uh, about how do you mobilize partnerships to have impact where everyone is leveraging their distinctive assets and capacities. It's called collective impact sometimes now. Uh, and I'll return to this later. So again, just drawing on our history, and I will come to the modern day uh, soon enough, but it's, I wanted to use this example because I find this example really interesting in terms of illustrating how we try and operate. 
um, and how we leverage basic research as well. So going back almost 100 years, one of the Rockefeller Foundation's early successes was to eradicate hookworm infections from populations. And uh, unknown to many, this was uh, sapping the health and energy of countless school children. And as we were trying to improve education in the southern United States, we came across the fact that actually the root cause of it was uh, health problems. And in some areas of the south, uh, infection rates were reaching up to 60%. So medical researchers had already found a vaccine for hookworm. And they had discussed it with the foundation staff. After some internal deliberations, they decided to invest more fur uh, further in this and launched a campaign to eradicate hookworm in the southern United States, which is very bold and had a very definitive end goal. But the staff knew that the vaccine was only part of the solution. The eventual eradication of the disease depended on taking a very broad and comprehensive systems approach stepping back to look at all the factors that were involved and trying to use a very wide range of tools and strategies that would complement uh, each other to attack this big problem. So for example, one of the broader systems issues was the cultural challenge. Uh, in the 1930s, this wasn't very long after the United States Civil War, and there was quite a bit of suspicion from the South to the North, and the, we certainly didn't want the perception that the North was coming down to fix the children in the South because Southern parents couldn't do it themselves. Uh, so there was intensive engagement with media, with public health officials to make sure that they owned it and that they drove it. And in fact, movies had just become recently popular and one of the very first public service announcements was funded by the foundation to advertise the benefits of these hookworm vaccinations and get the uh, public on their side. So while there was this scientific breakthrough in the vaccine itself, it required a lot of other different tools and approaches. And that is the core of how we have worked, which is to take a systems approach. And it's when you marry the systems approach with partnerships that I think you can get very creative in how to address the complex social problems uh, that we face. So, um, so this is a little bit about uh, the history of the foundation. And when I joined the foundation, it was very interesting because I'd come from a world of advising on strategy for financial services companies and telecom companies. And those problems are actually, in retrospect, relatively easy. It's pretty easy to understand what the goals are, and they're just not as complex as social problems are. So when I first joined, pretty much every tool and approach I used just wasn't working at all. And I took a step back to think about, well, what is it about the problems that are different here? And I found something uh, that was quite useful um, in terms of this framing uh, or this term called a wicked problem. Now, some people like the term, some people don't like the term. But basically, in the 1970s, a couple of design theorists created the notion of wicked problems. And these are problems that are difficult or impossible to solve because they're incomplete, they're contradictory, changing requirements are often difficult to re uh, recognize, and they're always evolving. And also, because of so many complex interdep uh, interdependencies, the effort to solve one aspect of a wicked problem may reveal or create other problems. And I use these pictures to help illustrate um, the difference between a complicated technical problem and a really complex wicked problem. So if you're building a bridge, I think everyone can agree to what success is. Everyone can agree when you're done building the bridge. Most people can decide which version of a bridge is better than another version uh, based on cost or its strength or its potential load. Now let's say you're faced with a problem of improving traffic flow, which would be this next picture. Well, that depends whether you're going north or south. Uh, and because this is all complex, you don't know if you add an on-ramp what kind of other impacts that will happen in the rest of the traffic system. No one will agree that you've fixed the traffic problem. You'll just make an improvement, and sometimes you might even make it worse. So there's this very different feature of these complex, wicked problems that helps characterize how social problems are sometimes very different than the technical uh, problems or the research problems that are studied by scientists. And here's a quote by Horst Rittal, who is one of the theorists who framed this that I think captures this well as uh, too. The search for scientific bases for confronting problems of social policy is bound to fail because of the nature of these problems. Policy problems cannot be definitively described. Moreover, in a pluralistic society, there is nothing like the indisputable public good. There's no objective definition of equity. Policies that respond to social problems cannot be meaningfully correct or false, and makes no sense to talk about optimal solutions to these problems. Even worse, there are no solutions in the sense of definitive answers. 
So that's a little bit depressing if you're in the business of solving these complex social problems. Um, but this is why I don't believe that you can separate strategy and change, because one of the features of these problems is that you need to start solving the problem to really understand what the problem even is. And that's why I think there's an important feedback loop that needs to be created between those who are implementing and solving and then feeding back new knowledge, new ways of looking at the problem to researchers who can then supply a fresh set of ideas to those who are actually working at the front lines. So that is one thing that we've, we've very much learned uh, in our history and our work and how we approach setting strategy and addressing problems as well. There's a second, um, and don't worry, I'm not gonna go through this slide in detail. Uh, there's a second uh, thing that we've learned and I alluded to earlier, which is about system change. So um, let me describe to you what, what, where this is coming from. Recently, we've been looking at the problem of rural electrification in India. And one of the problems is the national grid is not extending and it won't for 20 or 30 years. Uh, there are lots of models that have been built to create small solar plants that'll put up wires and uh, sell electricity to villagers, but they're just not economically feasible. So they just become grant funded demonstration projects. What we discovered though, was that cell phone towers have proliferated into rural India quite a bit. It's uh, the last remaining major market and it's quite profitable and people will pay money for those. These cell phone towers are powered by diesel generators, which are dirty and now they're expensive. So the cell phone towers are interested, the cell phone tower companies are interested in finding another source of energy. So what you can do is build a small solar plant that provides electricity to the cell phone tower companies who are going to pay more of a premium price, provide electricity to the villagers, and then also provide electricity to small micro businesses for the purpose of economic development. The fact that you have a bigger load means that you can bring down the cost per unit. All these different customers tend to use electricity at different times so you can balance the load. And so we figured that you can actually create a viable business model out of this. And with a little bit of grant funding, we can catalyze a lot of private sector investment and a lot of operational capacity. So that's great, we can make that work in a lab. But once you start thinking about scaling it up, you have to think, first of all, the rural communities. How are you gonna build trust with them so that they can understand and think about buying electricity when it's not a normal pattern uh, for them? Uh, on the bottom corner, you'll see a circle around investors. And this is something that Jeff will be talking about, which is how can we blend different forms of capital together so that multiple people's interests can get recognized. On the top, you'll see the government. They have lots of policies and they have lots of subsidies that they can make available. So how do we think about setting up these plans to take advantage of those policies and help the government realize their mission and their objectives and their frankly political objectives as well? So there's a whole complex set of actors. They interact with monetary flows, with technical knowledge, with influence as well. And so another way we try and look at everything is to paint a picture of the system. And we'll have a different picture of the system, and that's an encouraging uh, dialogue as well. But a lot of what I wanted to put this slide up for from a research foundation perspective is to highlight there's lots of opportunities in the system for research to play a role. So people who are doing research on policies and change in government, people who are doing innovative finance, people who are doing even technical research on battery uh, length, uh, and also new payment systems, et cetera. Once we can paint a picture of this system, it becomes a little bit easier for people to figure out where they can play, and that makes partnership and collaboration a little easier as well. So now let's move on to these uh, topics of strategy and change. So the first thing about strategy, and the first lesson that I would like to share is nobody really knows what strategy is. It means a different thing to everyone that you ask. And The Economist captured this uh, and you know, we'll periodically talk about it as well. In general, we know that it involves setting goals, determining how those goals will be achieved, and then mobilizing the resources to execute. So essentially, strategy tends to be about what to do and how to do it, but I can assure you that no one has a ex widely accepted definition of what strategy is. And There's many good ways and there's many uh, professionals who can help with strategy. But as, I, and I think Natalie made this point in her presentation on brand as well, it's really important to have an internal conversation about strategy. So the first question I'll usually advise um, uh, organizations when they're thinking about strategies, first of all, 
what is our current strategy? And if you ask 10 senior leaders that question, you'll get about 14 different answers, uh, depending on the day. So it's really important for people to even develop an understanding of what, what is the current strategy. And then to really articulate, well, why should we change it? What is the actual performance failure that we're trying to correct for? And I, that's why I found the survey question very interesting, where most of the people here in the room thought that there was more performance potential from executing a current strategy than changing a strategy. So if all of a sudden there's energy or discussion about changing a strategy, why is that the case? You know, most often it's the case because there's a new leader or a CEO, and that's something that new leaders and CEOs do. Um, and uh, it could be because they have a different vision, whatever the case may be. But is there some new change in the environment? Is there some failure that's happening? Is something becoming outdated? Uh, but really understanding what is the point and what do we expect to happen when we change our strategy. And then lastly, the other question that isn't often uh, discussed much in strategy efforts is how will we decide? Usually it is the leader of the organization who will have the final vote. And there can be a very awkward uh, dynamic that gets set up when it's, uh, there is a notion that it's going to be a democratic process, but ultimately a very small set of people will be deciding. But making it explicit of how strategy will, uh, how the final strategy will be decided is pretty critical um, as well. So this is just a, a suggestion on strategy. Again, I'm not trying to go into the theory of strategy that much. But as people think about changing strategy, these are three questions I find that are almost always overlooked and are very useful to keep in mind as well. Now for um, research organizations, I've found uh, this framing helpful and, and this will also point to something I'll talk um, about towards the end. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this framework called Pasteur's Quadrant. And the basic idea is that you can make a choice of where to focus as a research organization based on, on two dimensions. So how fundamental is the knowledge that you seek? And then how important is ultimate use as an inspiration? And most commonly, scientific in inquiry is divided into basic research, uh, which is very curiosity-driven work that contributes to general knowledge, or it's applied research, uh, which is really performed in the service of some known goals. I think what this model highlights is that there's a third option, and that's the top right quadrant, uh, which is called Use Inspired Basic Research, and it's named after Louis Pasteur because that's essentially the approach that he took. Um, he, Pasteur never undertook a study that wasn't applied, that didn't have some practical application, but he also kept in mind the fundamental contributions to science. So his work on uh, pasteurization and the safety of, uh, of how we eat now really spawned the field of microbiology, and it uh, really changed the way that we see the causes of disease. So Pasteur's quadrant illuminates a path where applied goals are not necessarily in tension with scientific creativity and rigor. And that's where we as a foundation think that there could be uh, many useful partners. We tend to be more applied now. We see ourselves more as the engineers and architects of solutions using existing knowledge. But we also know that there has to be some more fundamental work and fundamental innovation happening. So the idea of how do you create the right flows of information that I talked about earlier between what are some of the needs and what are some of the interesting opportunities. And I think sometimes there's a perspective that if you connect the two, uh, those two aspects too closely, it can be limiting of imagination. But I would argue that there's, there's ways not to be. So you've decided what your strategy is, and now it's time to implement it. Um, there was a notion uh, discussed in the 70s that's also reappeared in some articles. This is a graphic, actually, of an old idea in a new article um, on emergent strategy. And uh, the basic idea with emergent strategy, and maybe I'll just explain this chart as the best way to describe it. Uh, the idea behind emergent strategy is that strategies change as you begin to implement. And there's a famous military quote that no strategy survives contact with the enemy. And then there's a quote from boxing, which is everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. And so the basic idea starting on the left side here is that you can have an intended strategy um, and then parts of that intended strategy just won't work and they peel off as the unrealized strategy. 
Then your remaining uh, piece is the deliberate strategy. This is what you had planned to do and you're actually executing. And then there are forces that are emergent strategies. So these are just new ideas people have as they're in the field or as people you're partnering with introduce new thinking that didn't occur to you. And you can blend that with what you intended to do, with what you're discovering that you can do, and that results into actually what is your realized strategy. Now, often people try and resist this, and success is measured on, well, how closely did what happen compare to what we planned to happen? And the approach here, and it's a different mindset, which is to assume that whatever plans you have won't be the plans you implement, and how do you learn from that, and how do you course correct all the time? And so that's why sometimes I refer to strategy as more of a process than an answer. And I think that's a helpful uh, mindset to have. So what we try and do at the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, two things. One is recognizing that we'll have to adapt, we try and limit how much analysis we do up front. Uh, because there's this phenomenon called analysis paralysis, where you can get frozen in trying to answer all sorts of questions. And we just recognize we'll have to accept some uncertainties and risks. Having said that, we have built up the capacity to very quickly monitor, adapt, and more importantly, make decisions so that we change along the way. So knowing that you're going to take an emergent strategy approach means that you need to have some different organizational cap capabilities, less emphasis on the planning and more emphasis on the monitoring and adapting. Um, and this is actually a lot of how um, uh, strategies realized, particularly with um, web uh, application companies, because they can develop such quick feedback loops with their testers uh, and adapt very quickly. So building in that flexibility I find very important. Now let me turn to the uh, second major topic, which is around change. And so this is uh, one of my favorite cartoons about change, which again goes at that, that question of how valuable are the plans that you develop uh, for change. And the, the sad thing about change is that most change efforts actually do not work. So in 1995, John Cotter researched the success and failure of organizational change efforts and found that only 30% of them succeeded. In 2008, and after much more research, McKinsey found the same thing when they researched the field. And the, the reason, and there's many reasons, but the most simple reason is that change is really hard at all levels because you're dealing with human relationships, you're dealing with organizational systems, and most importantly, as I mentioned at the beginning, you're dealing with emotion. Uh, and that can be a very difficult thing uh, to work with. And people often overlook the power of emotional commitment and how connected people can be to their work. So I want to take uh, just a short side story here. I, I put this up mostly because it's a memorable image. I saw a fascinating documentary recently called Jiro Dreams of Sushi, and it's a documentary from a few years ago about Jiro Ono, who's an 85-year-old sushi master who's devoted his entire life to perfecting the art of sushi making. And his restaurant is a three-star restaurant, uh, three-star mi from the Michelin uh, Guide. And what the movie makes so clear is how many elements of the production of sushi are craft. The making of the rice, the buying of the right fish, the cutting of the fish, the packaging it together. All of this is something that you spend years and years and years in working on and perfecting. And it's, it's a way of looking at work in the same way that artists look at their work or craftsmen look at their work. And I believe we've lost that. I believe that we have reduced work to a bureaucratic notion of completing forms and papers and we've lost that spirit of work as craft. Because essentially, people like to take pride in their work. They like to be proud of their accomplishments. They like to take their, tell their friends and families about what they have achieved at work. And so once you start to look at work as craft, and once you start to think about a strong emotional force that people have, and motivational force is the pride that they take in their work, that helps you think about organizational change a little bit differently. Now this was uh, some work and research that I had done when I was an organizational consultant around you know, emotional drivers uh, that couple with strategy. And um, after a few years of this work with my colleague uh, John Katzenbach, um, who had thought along these ways uh, when he was at McKinsey and then started up a separate firm, we put our ideas into a book where we captured our thinking in this essential framework 
uh, which is there is a formal part of the organization, which is very good for being planful, for being efficient, and for managing accountability. And then there's an informal side to the organization, which is generally how work really gets done, and it captures a lot of the emotional drivers of work. So whereas on the formal, you know, people will decide or are expected to decide what to do according to the strategy of the organization, the informal side, it's really values that will on a day-by-day -day basis guide what, uh, what people do. And so, for example, a company like Southwest Airlines, which has such strong values around getting a plane off on time, it's not uncommon for pilots to jump down and help the baggage handlers get the bags on, on the plane because they are so driven by that value. Uh, in the formal organization, you have structures, and these are defined units of marketing and research um, and sales that are supposed to organize how work happens. But really, people in organizations have a wide and diverse range of personal and social networks. So for example, in the United States at least, there's always a network of people who smoke, and they spend time getting to know each other and talking as they leave the building to stand around and talk and, and smoke together. That can be a powerful network if you choose to use it. Uh, and there's networks based on interests, there's networks based on where people originally sat or when they joined a, uh, an organization as well. And then I've already touched on this in terms of motivating accountability and performance. On the formal side, you have metrics, and you can hold accountability, and you can give bonuses based on that. But then how do you help people take pride in their work? And that is a big driver um, for both resisting change and adopting change as well. So I like to introduce this framing because it's useful for people to keep in mind as you have a wide range of tools and levers when you want to drive change in an organization. And they're not only the formal levers that feel the easiest to change because you can do those on paper. And I touched on this a little bit at the beginning, which is particularly for research organizations. And I remember I gave a talk to um, a set of young, uh, young researchers who were just starting to lead lab teams. And it was very, very helpful. And it was from that discussion I created this list. And there's some aspects that are just overlooked, uh, particularly for very analytical and strategic people, which is typically the kind of person that someone who works in a research institution will be. So one, change is emotional. I've already talked about that. Uh, the second is around using the current culture. There's a lot of discussion and a lot of framing around how do we change the culture. The reality is it's extraordinarily difficult to change culture. But you can always use aspects of the current culture to help drive a change if you can just reframe it. So for example, I try and do lots of things at the Rockefeller Foundation. And one thing that I've discovered is that people take deep, deep pride in our history. So I've created a partnership with our archive center. They come in and present different aspects of our uh, culture uh, or our work. And I always take advantage to draw illustrations of what program officers were doing then and how it can apply now. So most recently, I'm trying to develop a sense of how do we say no in a respectful way, but we have to say no. And just to be able to point to so many examples in our past when we had to say no uh, helps people see that in a different light than me just telling them to say no, because that way it feels like I'm trying to ruin and squash their curiosity. Um, teamwork is a discipline. A lot of work happens in organizations and particularly change through teams. And people automatically assume that if you put a bunch of people together, that they'll just start working together. And there's a lot of ways to think about clarifying goals, clarifying roles, and spending time and investing time in thinking about how you're going to operate as a team. That's really important. Um, integrating leadership and management. At one point, it became very popular to think about there's managers and there's leaders, and they do very different things. The reality is every manager has to lead and inspire, and every leader has to know the details and be able to make decisions and manage. And so I encourage everyone to think about in a change situation, what is your leadership and management role, and how, is, how are they working together? And then lastly, and this is probably the most uncomfortable uh, aspect for really academic researchers, is just to realize that power is always in the air. People thrive on it. People are shy to talk about it. They feel uncomfortable talking about it. They feel guilty expressing a desire for it. But it's always present. And it's something that's worth uh, acknowledging as well. So we've covered strategy. We've covered a little bit about organizational change. This is at the more individual level of leading change. And I wanted to leave uh, you with a parting thought before we open it up for questions, which is what I think is a big opportunity for research foundations. And it is this area of resilience. And I mentioned earlier how 
at least at the foundation, we believe now that we are going to be entering a situation where change will be the new normal. And the ability to deal with the unpredictable and to deal with changes that we can't predict will become increasingly critical. Uh, and so we've done a lot of work in this area. We started at it from the climate change perspective, where we thought about, well, there's lots of people working on mitigation of uh, climate change. If we assume it's going to happen, how do we pe help people prepare and cope for climate change? And we've expanded that to think about other shocks and stresses, whether they are health shocks, like we're seeing in West Africa with the Ebola crisis, or whether there are slower stresses like economic transformations like we in the United States saw in Detroit uh, through some industrial change. So my, um, my boss and the president of the uh, Rockefeller Foundation has just recently put out a book called The Resilience Dividend, uh, where we try and paint a picture of how investing in resilience not only helps you avoid costs, but creates lots of near-term benefits as well in terms of new opportunities, new innovations, uh, and jobs as well. And we have two major efforts that are really built around partnerships. One is uh, around 100 resilient cities, where what we've tried to do is create a network of 100 cities that will work together on their resilience challenges. Uh, they apply to become part of this network. If they win, we fund a new position in government called the Chief Resilience Officer, who is meant to coordinate across government and also interact with the private sector and other service organizations who can help cities improve their resilience. And then the second effort is something we call the Global Resilience Partnership, which I think is actually, and I hope, could be quite interesting for research um, organizations. We have partnered with USAID, which is the US government's development agency, and CETA, the Swedish government's development agency, where we've each put in $50 million for a total of $150 million, where we're going to focus on innovative partnerships to improve resilience in the Sahel, in the Horn of Africa and Southeast Asia, where they all have a different set of uh, risks and vulnerabilities. And what we're trying to do is figure out a mechanism of how can different organizations work together to surface needs of what the vulnerabilities are and share those needs globally to bring in new ideas and new solutions and new funding and new technologies to address those. The first thing that we've done is launched a challenge process where we have invited cross-disciplinary teams to work together on framing problems and potential solutions, and we'll fund them incrementally along the way. But we think through that process, we are learning so much about what people are observing as problems, what communities are expressing as their problems. And I think that will be a very rich source of the uses in Pasteur's quadrant that I hope could inform some new frontiers of what to invest in, whether it is the psychology of individuals or organizations on how they can be more resilient, whether it's new technologies or materials that can withstand the changes that we're thinking about, or even new economic models or systems that we need to help societies become more financially resilient and hopefully more equitable as well. So with that, I think I will conclude. I wanted to thank everyone for your attention, and I'd love to hear any comments or questions that this might have sparked for you. <clears throat> oh, we've got time for questions. Uh, oh, Jit, go ahead. Um, I'm curious. You framed informal versus formal organizational structure, and I wasn't quite clear. Were you saying that a change process should take one into account more than the other, or that there are equal sets of activities and practices that need to be managed concurrently? It's a good question. and. Um, I don't think one is better than the other. And in fact, that was something that surprised us in our research, which is there's a tendency, particularly in Silicon Valley, to think about the informal as being you know, what's needed. But if you're a small startup, usually your biggest challenge is how do we introduce formal processes? So I usually tell people, if you think the formal organization is bad, imagining having to invent or figure out how you got your paycheck every month. It's a pretty good thing that that's a formal process that no one has to think about or worry about. Um, so it's a question of using both. I think there's a bias to use and lean on the formal because you can get change teams, you can draw new org charts, you can create metrics and create strategies. Uh, and I think the informal isn't paid enough attention to, but you need to think about how they work in balance. Any others? Right here. 
Jens Karl Rasmussen, The Willem Foundation. Uh, can you put a few words on how you can use work as craft as a, a, a foundation employee? What, what, how can you nurture that environment that they uh, find it inspiring, take pride in the work and so on? It's a great question and frankly it's one that we're working on right now because uh, for foundation staff, particularly as program officers, the work can feel abstract and very indirect and it's hard to point to what concretely are they shaping. Uh, the two things that I have been uh, working on trying to identify as craft uh, for program officers, one is the framing of the problem or the idea that you want to then research or fund and to take pride in that framing and celebrate the ideas that you get. A challenge becomes when people take real pride in shaping the strategy of the organization that they're going to then fund, which can become a torturous relationship. The second thing that I think um, uh, people can take pride in the craft is building trusted relationships. That feels like, it can feel uh, like something that's it's deeply important to program officers and there is a craft to it of how do you engage with people directly and honestly, how do you be empathetic to their needs as well. So those are two things that are emerging among our staff as the craft side of what being a program officer is. What I'm trying to steer them away from is the craft is writing memos or writing articles or things like that, which is important. Um, but those other two I think are more important. Over here. Uh, Yes, I would like to ask uh, how much you actually have changed. I think if, if you look back in your history and, for example, uh, review how the program officers dealing with the Green Revolution actually worked, how, how much have you actually changed? Uh, so I'm sorry, is, is the question around how much have the programs we funded created change or how much no, have we changed? No, no, changed? how much you as a foundation oh, yes. has changed. I mean. When, when you dealt with such a complex and, yeah. and enormous challenge as the Green Revolution, that yeah. you were quite instrumental, you had all these sort of modern ideas in yes. place many, many years ago. Yes, um, great question. So um, one quick answer is not much has changed. And it's deeply gratifying to me to come up with a memo with a vice president of program at that time saying we're doing too much, we have to streamline our portfolio, and you know, it saves me the time of writing that memo to my staff uh, to, today. Um, but the foundation has evolved with its environment. So there's at one point in time when the foundation was created, there weren't very many institutions like it. There was no such thing as the National Science Foundation. Uh, and in fact, the Rockefeller Foundation gave away more funding than the US government internationally before World War II. So that was a period when we were doing everything and we were really filling a gap. Then there was a period where we really focused on creating institutions. So helping some of the United Nations agencies and some of the large international uh, non-government organizations. So that was kind of a period of building capacity and such. And now we're in more emphasis on being system integrators where we're recognizing actually a lot of the resources are out there, the financial resources, the organizational capacity, they just need to be reorganized or coordinated in different ways. Um, so that's a little bit about how we see our role. It's, it's not terribly different than what we did, but if I were to characterize it, that I think is how the foundation has changed. Okay, any more? Did I miss any more? Right here. I'm Lise Lotte Heugård from the Danish National Research Foundation. First of all, thank you for a beautiful presentation. It was very moving and very nice. I have myself worked with the Niels Bohr Cyclotron that you funded in 1938. It lasted here in Copenhagen until 1991, and it made isotopes for the hospital, uh, the research hospital where I work. Uh, I was uh, uh, thinking about your Pasteur quadrant, whether it is perhaps a little bit too simplistic. Because uh, we in the Danish National Research Foundation, we fund Niels Bohr like a basic curiosity driven research. We are behind 2% of the Danish funding, but we are behind 20% of the Danish patents. Mm -hmm. So very often Niels Bohr like curiosity driven basic research uh, has the uh, effect of uh, patents and, uh, and very good things for society. If you look at the Niels Bohr uh, 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 atom model from 1913, thinking about this beautiful place. Uh, some people say that uh, the Niels Bohr and uh, those who came after were be are behind 40% of the world's GDP. 
And uh, if we look at your cyclotone, the Rockefeller Foundation cyclotone here in Copenhagen in the 1930s, mm -hmm. it was behind the discovery of nuclear medicine, yes. which is very much applied research, but it was given for basic research. So what I'm just trying to say is perhaps we get the most out of basic research also in, time, in, in terms of applied research. And I hope you'll remember that in your future. I will. <laughs> so I, I don't disagree with that point, and I should have thought that this is a very sophisticated audience. <laughs> One rule of thumb is anytime you see a two by two, it's too simple. Um, <laughs> the basic point I wanted to make was around that the, I think the construct of basic and applied research is a false one, as you so eloquently pointed out. Thank you. Good. Okay, is that it? All right, let's give the uh, round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>